Okay, it's four o'clock. We'll get started on this f late Friday afternoon. I thought the people at, uh, came, that came at the one o'clock meeting were courageous. You're extra courageous. So welcome. This session is going to uh, is, uh, also going to be uh, live. So we'd like to also welcome the uh, audience that uh, join, is joining us remotely. This is uh, session N10 working on with large trusses. And the PDH code is 56609, 56609. I feel like I, somebody should be winning a lottery, but anyway, 56609. And my name is Sylvie Boulanger. I will be your moderator and I will also be a co-speaker. Uh, and we are just gonna give a qu few quick announcements, although you're probably uh, really well rehearsed by now, you know how to uh, register your PDH codes. Uh, the, the, there are stations here, and you can go to visit the website at aisc.org slash conference PDH in one word. Uh, now, for this presentation, um, you can ask questions as we go along or ask them at the end. It's up to you. Uh, and uh, we've also scheduled the presentation uh, to, to leave room for questions, so we welcome them. We are in room 207 AB, is that correct? Is somebody gonna flag me? Yes, okay. So that means that if, if people who are um, remote uh, can, uh, can send their questions to nasccroom1 at gmail.com, nasccroom1 at gmail.com. There's a note here that you can also do that, but we're here, so, you know, please do it live. We're, we're, we will be happy to answer your questions. Okay, so now I'm going to um, uh, give you a brief uh, bio of the speakers. Colin uh, Hughes uh, graduated from Georgia Tech in 2010, and he's been working uh, for Steel Fab ever since. Uh, he's worked in different departments in estimating and detail uh, coordination, but spends most of his time now in connection design work. And he will, he is uh, soon to be PE, um, and uh, I'm sure he's looking forward to that. My name is uh, Sylvie Boulanger, and I was, uh, I was, in the last session, I was about to mention how many years I've been in, this, in the industry, but I realized Colin wasn't born then, so I'm, <laughs> I'm skipping that number altogether. Um, I studied engineering at the University of Alberta. That's where I did my civil. I did my master's at Berkeley in structural engineering and my PhD in Switzerland. I started my career at the Canadian Institute of Steel Construction in Toronto. I've since been to Switzerland, Australia, and now I'm back in Montreal where I'm a VP Technical Marketing for Supermetal, a large steel fabricator uh, with plants in Canada and the US. I'm part of several committees and I write many articles and I used to hold a column as Dr. Sylvie where I answered a lot of technical calls Kind of missed that, so please ask questions today. So without further ado, I'd like uh, Colin to start the presentation. Thank you, Sylvie. Good afternoon, thank you guys for sticking around for the final presentation today and coming and joining us. As Sylvie mentioned, my name is Colin Hughes and we will be working with large trusses today. To start out, I thought I'd show us an image of a large truss. This is a 70-foot span architectural truss on one of the tallest buildings in Charlotte, North Carolina that we had done years ago. It's a three-dimensional truss made out of HSS members, and you'll see a few examples as we go through the presentation today. A quick overview of the presentation. I'll give you a brief company profile and experience to tell you a little bit about myself and SteelFab. And then we'll get right into the main topics to consider when designing large trusses that we decided were most relevant for this conversation. We'll be going over splices, camber, types of members used, and erection demands for large trusses. And after that, I'll hand it back over to Sylvie, where she'll get into some uh, very unique truss examples that Supermetal has worked through the last few years. SteelFab was started in the 1950s as mostly a miscellaneous metal shop and has grown over the years to a large uh, full steel fabrication plant in the southeast and Texas. Um, In-house, we handle estimating, detailing, project management, and steel fabrication. And as well, we've 
handle all sorts of projects from office space, skyscrapers, government buildings, and ballparks, a little bit of everything. Now to get into the large trusses, the first topic that we'll discuss today, we'll go through splices. Um, the first question we have is, what's the optimal number of splices in any truss? The answer to that is zero. Uh, if we're able to get away with it, depending on the constraints, the size of the span needed to truss, um, we'll try to get it in just one piece, all fabricated in the shop, and have zero splices. And then we'll go through what kind of splice connections are available to us and how we determine what type of splice we use, both for the field and for the shop. So the number one factor that we consider when determining splices, where to put them, and how many, if they're required at all, is the shipping capacities and crane capacities. So shipping capacities, for the most part, we try to keep uh, the trucks that we have anything longer than, wider than 12 feet becomes a little, little bit more of an issue. We can sometimes handle that. Uh, as you'll see in an example I'll bring up here shortly, uh, they normally require permits and a few other ho hoops and regulations that we have to go through. Length, depth, and weight are also major considerations um, for the different cranes that we're using, whether it's in the shop or in the field. And then site location also has an impact on how we splice any given truss. The shop crane capacities vary largely from shop to shop, even within fabricators. Uh, we have multiple branches, and you can see that our Alabama shop has about 40 ton capacity, Charlotte has 60, Super Metal can handle 100 tons. So it gives you a little bit of variance in basically, depending on who you're working with, what size limitations you have to deal with. And as far as going through the erection crane capacities, we didn't really want to put even a number on there because there's so many variables um, from job to job about how many cranes are on site, the different size cranes that they've picked to use for any given project, uh, soil conditions, things of that nature. A project that I'm going to bring up briefly, this is a, the NASCAR Hall of Fame, I'm sure, being in Tennessee. We have plenty of NASCAR fans, people are familiar with it. Uh, this is the Hall of Fame we did in Charlotte, North Carolina a few years ago. It involved retail space, convention center, uh, in the Hall of Fame itself, which is the home to um, Richard Petty, Dale Earnhardt, and of course, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> and the particular part of the project I'm going to discuss is a pedestrian bridge we did, which is a very small piece of the whole scale, but we put a lot of thought and consideration into this. As I mentioned, this project was in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where our headquarters is. It's five miles down the road from our fab shop. So as I said, normally we're limited uh, by the width of the trucks to what we can fabricate and get on site. But on this one, working with the state and getting several permits, we were actually able to fabricate this entire pedestrian bridge, which you can see is made out of two large vertical trusses on the sides, build up the platform between and above, and do that all in our shop, and ship it in one piece. This whole bridge, as you see it now, was actually picked up off the truck by the crane, put on the ground briefly, picked into place, and turned. You can tell the limitations there are pretty tight. We weren't able to move any of those signs, weren't able to cut down a tree branch, um, but working back and forth with the uh, owner and the job site and our rector, we were able to develop this plan, which ended up working out very well for everybody and saved the owner some money in the end. Uh, the two options of splices that we have for large trusses, similar to any connections in steel, we have welded or bolted options. For field connections, bolted options is generally the way that we like to go. Uh, it's generally quicker than welding, more cost effective, and the preferred method for a majority of the projects that we work on. There are some drawbacks with bolted connections. They can get pretty out of hand pretty quick once the loads start getting a lot larger, more towards full capacities of the members that we're using. You can see slightly here, it's kind of a dark picture, but on this particular bolted connection, the top and bottom flange are both bolted uh, with three inch thick steel plates on either side of the flange. And there's over 200 bolts per splice connection for this truss, and there are multiple splices along the length of it. This is the truss in use. It was in Montgomery, Alabama, over the RSA Judicial Building. It supports eight floors above it, so the, large that get, the loads that go through were quite large. 
This is the same connection that we detailed and sent over to them. We're pretty sure that they were going to want to switch over to a welded connection when they saw this, but um, talking back and forth with the design team, they decided this is the route that they wanted to take. As I mentioned, over 200 bolts, uh, those plates are three inches thick, and the bolts themselves were one inch grade A490 bolts. All of them were over a foot long. So we had to order those, especially long lead time. Uh, those became quite expensive themselves. But as I said, working through with the design team and the erector, it was the most cost efficient connection for this project. Yes, sir. So, good question. The question was, did we use bearing bolts or slip critical bolts? And we used bearing bolts um, snug tight. And in this one, we had to match drill this. Every plate that was on here, we match drilled in the shop to make sure they would fit up well in the field. And we even went through some uh, steps beyond that to make sure they would fit up. And I'll go over that a little bit more later on. But it's a good question and a good point that he brings up. A lot of times, in order to make sure that this fits up in the field, the design team will require that we go to a um, oversized hole, which requires slip critical bolts. As a lot of you are probably aware, when you go to slip critical bolts, you use, lose a lot of strength, and then you have to actually increase the number of bolts to make the connection work. So for a connection like this, where we're already at 200 plus, you're talking 300, 400 bolts, doesn't really seem so appealing after that. As I mentioned, our other option is going to welded options. We'll typically start looking at this from the get-go when we know we're at about 85% of the member capacity that we're using, whether it's for the cords or for the web members. Uh, you can see here that this, when you have full capacity you need to be transferred, you need to go with the CJP splice. There's also, of course, many drawbacks with using large splice connections like this in the field. They're very time-consuming. This connection was also part of the RSA judicial billing that we just looked at. It's tough to see here, but those are W14 by 730, 65 KSI cord members. And in talking with our rector, it was a few years since they had done this particular job, but I asked them how long it would take somebody in the field to put this connection together. They said it takes about 40 man hours of welding uh, for every splice location like this. So for the top and bottom cord, about 20, you know, about 20 hours for each flange. So kind of makes you appreciate some of your long 40-hour weeks in the cube that seem quite boring compared to welding for 40 hours straight. There are additional drawbacks to the welded option um, beyond just time and cost. There's also time and cost. Uh, additional shoring and alignment aids are required often when you are doing field welded splice connections. You can see here again on the left, that's the Duke Energy Building in Charlotte that I showed us earlier. Uh, there is two large platforms in the middle that are used just for shoring for the erection purposes of those splice connections. And if you went up to Charlotte now, you wouldn't see those anymore. They were taken down after the wells were completed and scrapped. And then the connection on the right is just an example of a welded connection with many erection aids that were required to keep it in line and in place for a proper fit up in the field. Next up, we'll go through camber. Talk about what are the two ways in which camber is developed in trust members. And we'll also discuss in framing members and how they are affected by cambering. So, first of all, what is cambering? Cambering is the allowance of members' geometry to account for deflection based on dead loads. Everyone's probably familiar with this. They're on beams all throughout the project, and they're also very important in trusses. The first way that we'll account for cambering these large trusses that we'll discuss are rolled cord members. So we will either roll the large members on either side to match the cambering requirements on the project, or if they're beyond what we can do in-house, which a lot of times they are, we'll have to order these from a specialty shop. Our next option is going to straight segmented members. So we'll use the requirements on the top cord, especially if there's varying levels of camber that are put in different areas, if there's very specific call-outs, we'll make sure that we meet the requirements um, for deflection at every location along the way by cutting several pieces of a long cord member and aligning them at just the right angles so that we match the profile required by the design, design team. Now there are positives and negatives to each of these approaches. 
rolled members are very nice. They look very smooth. Having just one cord piece is a lot nicer than multiple splices all throughout. If it needs to be AESS with rolled pieces, there's no grinding, nothing additional required in the shop. And then the downsides are that you are orium from a specialty plant oftentimes, and sometimes that leads to a long lead time. Whereas with straight members, we use the pieces that we order straight from the mills, and we use those. Um, we use those and use additional shop labor costs to piece together. It sometimes costs the project a little bit more in the shop with additional time to make the cord members. Um, so that is the disadvantage of straight segmented members. There are often in framing considerations that need to be accounted for when going through large span trusses. There's beam camber, and which is obviously similar to truss camber, but like I said, with trusses, we can't just slap a number on there and say, okay, once you put together the whole truss, then put it through a rolling machine and give it an inch or two of camber. It doesn't work like that. Uh, we've got to make sure that each individual piece is accounted for. And so that'll be done by detailing the cord by the entire truss two different times. Once we'll detail it in the typical model where all the other in-framing members are, the you know, transfer columns or posts that are on top will also be detailed on that model so that everything's detailed to the exact lengths that it's needed to for the service life of the building. And then we'll also take just the truss out of the building and put it in a separate model of its own and detail that again. This is an example where we use several straight segmented members to build up the top and bottom cord. You can see the individual orange pieces shown here for that large span from grid line C to F. And it's three different members that were angled just so uh, to provide the proper camber required by the design team. It also affects the infill members. Those uh, web members that you see, the vertical pieces as well as the diagonal pieces are affected by the detailing of the cambered straight segmented truss. Next up, we'll go through different members that are used, both in the cord and web pieces of the large trusses. And we'll also talk about what are the advantages and disadvantages of different sizes and shapes uh, from an engineering, fabrication, and erection point of view. So we've touched on this briefly already, but the cord members are the outside members, and the diagonals and verticals that make up the internal members are the web members. Uh, first piece that we'll discuss is the use of a WT as a cord member. This can be very beneficial, especially when transferring lighter loads. WTs are often used um, to our advantage by having the web as a piece that we can actually use as our connection material. So if we have HSS or angle web members, we'll just lap those directly onto the WT. This is an item where uh, working early on with the design team, once we receive the drawings, a lot of times the cord members will be sized just for the loads that are going through those, which can sometimes be quite small. So they'll pick the smallest, most economical WT size section. But by using a slightly larger section that might cost us more up front, we can avoid some of the additional fabrication costs. For example, in this picture, you can see that we had to attach a gusset plate with a CJP weld to the bottom of the WT in order to get the lap requirements that we needed to make those web connections. So that's something you can think about early on and sometimes give yourself some savings on the project. Next up, once we start getting into larger loads, wide flange members are predominantly used in the cords. Uh, they can accommodate much larger loads. A drawback uh, that sometimes isn't considered similar to what we just went over are the many members that are used uh, framing in to provide horizontal bracing. Again, while the vertical loads on these members that are providing the bracing might not be very large, there are certain requirements that they need to meet based off the cord members. A lot of times we're using shorter, stouter W14 cord members that are difficult to frame into. So you can see, for example, here, there are multiple members framing into those cords uh, that do the cope limitations while the loads weren't very large on them for a W16 by 26. Once you cope out both flanges, it was impossible to get the connection design through. So we had to add a lot of cope reinforcement as well as web doublers, uh, which is a lot of ex extra fabrication cost uh, that we weren't anticipating at the beginning. So sometimes, again, going to a slightly larger W16 with a thicker web uh, can prevent that from being an issue. 
There's also the option to use wide flange cord members in the horizontal direction. You get the same loads transferred through the cords and you don't have to worry as much about uh, horizontal bracing. Again, something that you do have to worry about is the framing of members into these wide flange horizontal braces. The connections aren't often as um, easy and clean as you would expect if you have larger members framing into the top flange of what's a W14. Sometimes there's not enough room there and you have to do a lot of additional upfront fabrication costs to make sure that the connection will transfer. Also, deck and floor supports are required um, where there's a gap between the flanges of the top. Lastly, for cord members, HSSs are popular sections that are used. They also require less horizontal bracing. They're used a lot in ASS trusses. Um, the connection designs and splices on these can be quite taxing. You'll see some in Sylvie's uh, presentation part coming up in case studies that show some complicated nodes that had to be reinforced in order to transfer some of the loads that were required to go through these sections. Uh, here you can see this is kind of a bird beak end that is at the very end here of this HSS. This is several segmented large hollow steel pieces that were framed for the cords of these trusses and partially for the camber, partially because it was the shape of the trusses, but at each location the steel had to be cut just so so that another bird beak piece could be rotated 90 degrees, slotted in there perfectly, and welded all around. Going into web members, angles again are what we'll predominantly use for lighter load trusses. Um, they can lap directly onto WT stems and also if you do have a wide flange cord member Typically, just one gusset plate will be required, which is a pretty simple fabrication process for gusset connections. Also, HSS members are similar in the sense that they can lap onto a WT or a single gusset plate with wide flange cords. And that single gusset plate becomes very appealing, especially when you look at some larger connections that you see here. Uh, very large built-up sections with flange extensions coming directly off the cords to accommodate easy fit up in the field but still very large transfer is going through. Another example, another condition that you can use for web connections that I do not have shown here, but Sylvie will bring up, are large end plate connections are often used for transferring the tensile and um, other loads through the truss members. And last item up we'll go through are some of the erection demands. Um, sometimes erection demands will require us to fit up a truss in the shop before we even send it out to the field. Sometimes we'll do that as we did on the NASCAR museum for ease of fabrication once we were out there. Sometimes we'll do it to make sure that the connections that we have fit up just right. If we're using 200 snug tight bolts with standard holes, uh, we'll often bring in the erection team and have them fabricate the truss on site before we send it out so that we know once it's out there everything will fit up just right and we don't have to worry about redoing a plate or anything changing once it's on site. If there's limited laydown area, if there's limited time to erect, uh, if there's large cambering requirements, these are some of the examples that will lead us to basically erecting the bridge twice, once in our own shop and then once again on the job site. This is that RSA truss that you saw over the building earlier. This is it laid out in our backyard. We had our erector come out, piece the whole thing together. And so back to your question earlier, what we do to make sure that we had the connection fit up tolerance just right, we fit up the connection in our backyard to make sure that everything was appropriately sized. And once we brought it out to the site, it worked fine. This next, exa next example is a, another pedestrian bridge 3D truss with camber requirements in all different directions. You can see it's not just vertical cambering on this member, there's cambering in all different sides that are required. So what we did was erect the entire bridge in our shop again, we brought in a laser sight device and took measurements of exactly where all the steel was located, checked it with our detailing drawings and requirements from the engineering team and made sure that it fit up just right before we sent it out in the field. From here, we took it apart, sent it out. They had two cranes on this particular project, so they were able to fabricate the whole thing on the ground, no shoring required, and pick it up in one piece and assemble it into place. And that concludes my portion. I'll go over real quickly what we learned today. 
The steel trusses cannot be beat. There's no other way to span the large distances, uh, carry the large loads that we do with large steel trusses or provide the ac architectural features that are required. Uh, there are a lot of things to consider in truss fabrication design beyond just sizing of members. And also be sure to identify any potential opportunities and roadblocks early on from sizing members to your advantage um, or figuring out how to redistribute loads. So from there, I will hand it over to Sylvie for case studies. Does anyone have any questions for me before I hand it over? Yes, sir. For our detailing? detailing for detailing and erection, so the question was do we use a no load, dead load, or self, self weight of the structure? The uh, I'm not actually sure that I can answer that 100% for you. I'm sorry. Yep. Anything else? All right. Thanks, guys. What? <laughs> what if we just do cancel? Right. On the top of it, I'm a Mac user, so. Uh, yes, ooh. <laughs> like, I'm a lot braver than when I said that I was a Mac user many years ago. So, because I know I'm not alone, even among engineers. So, there we go. Okay, so what we're going to be looking at is. Um, uh, different applications of trusses and going through some of the points that uh, Colin raised and see how they apply to some of these projects. So uh, briefly, Supermetal is a 700 person operation. We have four plants, uh, in uh, one in Rock Hill uh, in South Carolina and three in Canada. We have a construction division uh, and uh, an office uh, also in the Philippines. Uh, we have uh, been in business since 1959, and we're specialized in complex steel works in the institutional commercial sectors. Some of the projects you see at the bottom, at the left is the actually uh, it's in Troy, New York, the Electronic Media and Performing Arts Center, which was a lot of fun. And there's a 50-story building in the middle, and um, what we've done a lot of is uh, large industrial, well, complex industrial projects. So I think we, I, I wanted to start by sort of uh, coming back to what uh, a truss is. Wikipedia is always great for that. Um, and um, it def the, the, the Wikipedia defines a truss as a structure that consists of two force members that uh, are assembled in such a way that uh, a, you, when you have a number of them, you have uh, an, a, a single object. And um, the advantage is that loading only at the two nodes, you either have tension or compression in the members. So you can say that there's a lot of honesty in a truss, because you really, what you see is what you get. Now, I look back at what, when the first trust uh, was identified in history, and apparently there is, it comes from navigation. Uh, the rope truss is the first truss to appear. So I think it's the only tension only truss that I've ever heard of, uh, but uh, that's, uh, that's for, for, for the bit of history. But as time went on, when did the truss appear? It really started to appear when you could have tension and compression in uh, members and really only appeared in the modern era. But I think the, the thing that really helped the truss to take off, so to speak, is the truss bridge. And if you've ever been to Quebec City, you've seen this beautiful uh, bridge. It's almost uh, 100 years old. It holds a record. It's actually the, uh, it holds the world, world record for the longest truss cantilever bridge in the world. They don't build them like this anymore, so that helps us hold on to our record. But it's a beautiful bridge, and there's also lots of lessons learned. We've, we've heard a lot about failures uh, in these talks and how we can learn from them. There were two failures in this bridge before uh, it got into its final, um, 
into its final function. And it's really a really interesting read. So if you're interested, Quebec City Bridge Failures, oh, it's not very positive, but you'll get a lot of interesting information. Now, just uh, last week I was over, our head office is uh, close to Quebec City, and I was crossing the, the Quebec City Bridge, and I always like to look at it, but the St. Lawrence River is still half frozen. Please send us a little bit of heat. We are just fed up with cold. Talking about that part of the, part that part of the, that part of the the um, the world, which is, uh, um, I just want to congratulate the local hockey team for having beaten my all-time favorite hockey team, the Montreal Canadiens, on Tuesday night, um, and. and uh, it kind of put a damper on the new the head, headlines back home, where we would have liked to have said, you know, Habs hit 100 points and won against the Predators. But uh, congratulations, you won overtime, and that's not often that you see Carey Price letting a goal like that go by. But uh, you're all deserving, and I'm all tears. <laughs> now, since uh, we're sort of on the French end of things, um, you should know that the word trust actually is derived from the old French word trousse, um, and it means a collection of things bound together, which in a way is not far from the truth. truth. And actually the French word is a much uglier word, and this, I don't know how you guys en ended up borrowing a nice French word and we got stuck with an ugly one in French, but that's the way it goes. Okay, so the trust has a lot of history, uh, and it's uh, really, with time, um, became went from the truss bridge, and it really invaded sort of the roof trusses, and that's where we've seen them a lot. But if they've taken on a lot of different forms, and I'm going to show you a few of the classic uses of what we think of as when we talk about large trusses. But there, uh, we go much farther than that. So this is Eighth Avenue Place. There's going to be a huge transfer truss we're going to look at, the uh, the IOC building in Labrador, uh, and uh, student residence in Manitoba, and an airport in Calgary. So there's going to be a transfer truss, something we use uh, the trusses for a lot. There's going to be a cantilever truss, which is quite unique. And then we're going to have stack trusses, which I, I think I've only seen in this building, So, uh, but I'm sure it's not going to be the last time. And then an AESS truss, where you have, you have the works in terms of exposed uh, uh, connections and uh, H use of HSS. It's not a presentation about truss connections, but we we know that there are important uh, elements in, in trusses. Uh, so I'm just bringing up a, a sort of the, the, the checklist that we feel is quite a, very important for, uh, for truss connections. Uh, for instance, if you look at uh, loads, and many of the trusses hold very, very high loads, um, a, a common application will be to use very, very uh, uh, deep um, uh, end plates in order to transfer the heavy loads. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, factors that will um, influence the use of truss connections. For bolted truss connections, we really like to use the snug tight bolts and we find, and I know that others have uh, the same uh, complaint, could we call it, same observation, that um, uh, pretension high strength bolts tend to be uh, overspecified. Uh, you really, really need it if you absolutely need slip resistance or uh, energy dissipation or oversized slot holes, but you really want to try as much as possible to stay away from that. For the welded truss connection, uh, I think people underestimate the impact of uh, full, uh, full pen welds and uh, as much as possible in the field to use bolts rather than than welds, um, and in particular, in particular if we can stick to the PJP or fillet welds, it does uh, make a difference because more welding really is not necessarily the best avenue. Okay, so 8th Avenue Place, this is a transfer truss that we're going to be looking at. It's a two-story tall transfer truss that's 74 feet by 36 feet and it's 136 of your tons, so uh, it uh, means that it's a heavy piece. It has to be because it has to support uh, the north side of the tower and actually it's transferring two 45-story 
245-story columns. We were working uh, on that project with Reed Jones, Christofferson, and Ellis Don. So I'm going to be taking back some of the elements that were discussed before and looking at the particularities for each project. I have to use, I have to find another word than particularities. It's it's brutal when you have to say it from your, from you have a French background. So any any suggestions instead of particularity, criteria or factors? What's that? Specifics. I can handle those S's. Yeah, specifics. So we'll look at the specifics for this project. Good one. Um, and what you'll see is that we have some really heavy-duty uh, splices because everything uh, in that, uh, in the, um, how do you say, uh, in, in the sub-assembly that we've uh, decided to, um, to have, it was weight-governed. A lot of the times you'll use the splices because you can only transport a certain size, but this is really, really weight-governed. And we have uh, all the W shapes were 65 KSIs. We had one and one eighth inch A49 uh, standard uh, holes. Thank God, no AESS there. Everything was hidden. Uh, and you, as you can see, we have some huge loads. We have 8,500 kips in the compression and 3,500 kips in the tension. And some of the members go up as high as W14 by 730s. So just to situate where that transfer truss is, it's right at the bottom where you see the, the, the orange circle. And if you look at um, the plan view, the transfer truss is situated at the entrance of a garage. So that's where the uh, transfer truss is. So this is what it looks like. So really when you look at it, um, what, uh, what we've done is we've taken the two point loads um, and transferred them on two inclined columns and tied them together. So you can see that over here, you know, these aren't doing very much. It's really happening here, these sections. So when you look at it a little bit more closely, if this was really symmetric and you had even loading at the top, these should be in compression. And it turns out that one of them, if you look at it more closely, this one is intent. Well, you can see by the connection that the tension governed in that particular connection. So you wonder why, why that is. And I asked the engineer, and he said, well, one of the columns is twice as heavy as the other. That imbalance created that uh, uh, situation. So you look at that truss, and you say, well, how are you going to cut it up so that it can be transported? So if we look at the model, and we, come, and we highlight um, how we've broken it down, it's really, there's really three heavy pieces, and the heavy sections are really around where the major nodes are. So we have this piece uh, here and here. So these are the three uh, components that get sent as an assembly, and then all the other pieces are sent individually. An important factor for this, uh, uh, for the transfer trust was to consider camber. Actually, there wasn't much information for us from the, um, um, from, um, the, the, that came from the design uh, side. And we find that camber is always something we, we uh, want to do engineering. Uh, we want to look at it ourselves very, very closely. Because when you think about it for the engineering of a record, if it doesn't quite, if it's not quite the right number, it's, you know, oops. But if, you, uh, if we don't get it right, it's really ouch. You know, you're, you can't make things fit, and you, you're in, in a very um, uh, difficult situation. So to calculate this particular camber, which was about three-quarters of an inch, um, we, had, we loaded the truss gradually, so uh, to uh, take into account column shortening and uh, concrete shrinkage, and then ended up with the number that we needed. So it, uh, it looks really, really stiff, but you still to have to account for some camber. The geometry is extremely important, so when we set up the, um, all the different elements, when we fabricate all the elements, we needed to do the pre-assembly, and when we did the pre-assembly, we asked to fill in the blanks by our staff and um, made sure that we didn't tell them to check it off. Uh, and total stations were used to really have as much accuracy as possible. 
this is what it looks like. It's a little bit dark for you, but you can see that uh, this uh, truss really absolutely filled up our shop. So this is uh, our Sherbrooke shop. This is the one that can handle 100 tons, the, a lot of the heavy lifts. And uh, so they uh, did the full assembly right in the shop. So you can see by the size of the person here that the dimensions are non-negligible. Okay, so if we look at one of the connections a little bit more closely, we can see that I think we've respected uh, Carol Drucker's uh, um, uh, sort of recommendations on load path. We really try to limit the, any kind of bending you might have in the plates, so limit some of the eccentricities and transfer the loads directly underneath. So what if you look a little bit more closely, you can see that the loads are being transferred uh, directly underneath these uh, main elements and uh, the base plates are used to transfer the heavy loads. As you can see, wherever you see it's, it's bolted, it's, it's meant for the site, and then everything that's welded was done in shop. We were able to get away, we can say get away, because sometimes you can't always, to have that big truss completely bolted on site. But to have that happen, we had to make sure that we have very good um, uh, very good contact between those those plates. Here's a representation uh, of this this uh, same element in 3D, and this is the section. Well, not quite the same, but similar as it's uh, being fabricated and fitted up. And here we see it in the field. Notice here uh, what you couldn't see, but you can see the prolongation of the uh, the reinforcement which really follows uh, the load as much as possible to keep it simple for something that has to transfer large loads. You don't want to be going around and making detoured, uh, detours for the loads. Excuse me, I have, <coughs> same thing happened to me earlier. I have a, a cat in my throat. A yeah, a frog. You use a frog? I wonder why that is. <laughs> Okay, well, moving right along. Um, so what was really important is since these were very, very heavy loads, you had to make sure you had the proper contact. So these plates were actually machined uh, to a surface where you had to meet the criteria of having at least 75% of the entire contact area in bearing. So that means you couldn't have more than two one hundredth of an inch uh, um, separation over that area. So you really have to have a nice flat surface for that to transfer well. So here's a view of that uh, uh, transfer truss. You can see uh, the erection, uh, how we, we erected it. So we had the big elements at the bottom. We put the sticks here and then it fitted perfectly here. I don't know why I don't have an image of that. It's really beautiful to see it come down and go click. Not, not click, but you know, fit pretty nicely. Okay, so that's uh, for that transfer truss. Now we're into the cantilever truss. By the time I show this image, people usually look at it and have difficulty figuring out what's happening. So I, that's, why I'm, that's what I'm here to, to do, is to help you understand this, uh, this uh, particular uh, design. Um, this, so this is an iron ore depository. And uh, there's one, there was one conveyor belt, and they wanted to add a second one. But the engineers looked at the, the existing building, and they said, we are not touching that building. So you can have another, uh, you can have the conveyor, but we're going to have the, the uh, uh, couples of trusses together, cantilevering out, and we are going to put the conveyor on the inside uh, that are hanging from these cantilever trusses. But how do you get the conveyor in there in the existing building? Well, we actually launched it. It was launched like a bridge. And in our contract, they said, um, you know, they, when we, we, we submitted the bid, they said, uh, this has to be launched and you do all the engineering. So that really reduces your competitors really quickly when, you, when, when that happens. But uh, so we did. 
So the truss, uh, typical truss weight was uh, over 100 tons. We were working with Bechtel on this. Um, the way the cantilever truss was built was with frames. You have to recognize this is in Labrador, so when you're going over those roads, you want to keep things to a minimum. So these were actually frames, and then there were sticks. We had a grade 65 steel on it uh, for that, and obviously no AESS there. So you have a better view of this uh, particular truss. So just as reference, you can see a person here. So these are big trusses. So here's the way that we broke them up, uh, and I'll, I'll show you in the next image a closer view. So the heavier pieces are here at the base, and um, they're 12 to 15 tons, and they get a little lighter as you go up. And all the elements in gray were shipped individually. So that's how, it, uh, that's how we set it up. And so they were sent out as frames, and then we completed sub-assemblies with the elements and then we put a, them up really like a mechano. So you can see how uh, some of these elements came up. So the frames are delivered, some of the individual elements are connected, and they are erected into place. So you can see one here that's about to be uh, to, to connect. There were two issues that really made this project uh, a bit of a challenge. There was a lot of engineering that went into the launching. Everything went perfectly. You know, and all the, the fitting of the trusses, things went perfectly. Then we came on site, and nothing fit perfectly at the base plate. So um, we're not next to our shop here, and we're not just asking to machine just a little base plate here. It's these frames are there. So that's one issue that we had to deal with. And the other issue is that when we were um, building this, um, the general contractor decided that he wanted to wait before he put some grouting underneath. You can do that in columns, you know, and you wait and then you, you sort of uh, try to put it in the right position. But this is a cantilever, so what happened is as soon as it started to launch and they hooked it up onto the truss, the truss crushed these little shims, which are really tiny for the columns you saw, like, like they were going into butter, and then it tilted and rested on the existing building. Not good, really not good, okay? So um, we'll show you what, we, what solution we came up with, and you know, our panic level was uh, pretty high. So, what, so the first problem of these base plates were none of them fit, they were, none of them were in the right location. So we took an equipment and we oversized all the holes. So talking about holes in a budget, it's uh, really made a difference in how we manage the project. So that was very, very unfortunate. So the other problem that I was mentioning to you is you can see the base of this frame tilting, okay? So, um, and, the, and uh, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. I just wanted to show you uh, before that the tilt occurred, what um, how we launched the the conveyor. So uh, there's a lot of temporary steel in here, and what we did is we um, launched the bridge, and right at launched the the conveyor, and you can see there's the, the, here you have the nose. The nose is the if I can get this, but yeah, the nose of the conveyor is here, and there was a lot of temporary steel that was added so that it, it went right as planned. It would go up and then rest, go up and rest, and it, it, it behaved as planned. But at the first time when we transferred the load of the conveyor onto the first cantilever, that's when it tilted. Well, that's my sign to check the time. Okay. Um, I used to have these very subtle indicators of, you know, this is at, I, at this point, I should be at that point but they were so subtle I didn't see it. So I said, well, I'll just share it with, with everyone. <laughs> nice big star. Uh, okay, so what, how did we handle it? Well, first of all, our VP engineer was at work at five o'clock in the morning, contacting Hatch uh, about how we're going to solve the, the problem. 
and uh, by the end of the day, he had traveled with 4,000 pounds of steel in the truck and almost deaf by the time they got after those roads. You can imagine how these things shake. And uh, they had, a, they had a, a solution with them. So here's the solution. This was drawn the same day. So then he had detailers come in, you know, major, you know, one of those memorable days. So here you have the, the existing uh, legs you have the supporting beam, which is here, and then you have the lifting beam, which is connected to the columns. Then you insert here the jacks, the hydraulic jacks, and then you push it up a little bit, and then you put in right here the shims. So you push up, put the shim, push up, push the shim. Shh, shh, that's a lot of shh. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Here's the supporting beam, okay, and here are the jacks and here's the, uh, the, the, the beam the, that, it, that helps the lift so you push the jacks you put in the shims here you do that a few times and you've got it back in position fortunately we were able to keep the anchor rods so that is a good thing and that uh, is what the site looks like and everything well you can you can be sure that in the next ones when the contractor had erected a one of these cantilevered trusses, he grouted it immediately. So there was not too, many, too much discussion needed there. Okay, Pembina Hall is a very unique building uh, because of how the trusses are stacked. Are you guys doing okay? This is the end of the, the end of the, do you wanna stretch a little bit before? Oh, I have people remotely, so do, do you guys wanna stretch too? <laughs> Well, they can do it very discreetly. No, but seriously, let's do that. I, I threatened the other group, but now I'm going to, I used to take aerobics, but I think it's the end of the day. Everybody up. <laughs> yes, but I'm not, okay. So, okay, so people remotely, I'm, you're somewhere out there, okay. Put your shoulders up, okay, and then bend your knees. <sighs> Exhale while you do that. Up, <sighs> with your arms. Down to your, uh, what is chevy, chevy, ankles. <laughs> Go up, twist, jump if you like, but not with my high heels, so I'll let you do that. And then we'll get, get it ready to go again. Okay. But, <laughs> No, you'd be amazed. You'd be amazed, and any kind. You'd be amazed at just having a little bit more oxygen back. Then I get you guys to listen to me a little bit more carefully. So that was the. That was obviously the goal. So um, we did this with Burke Construction and Crozier Kilgore. Uh, this particular project. The image is a little bit dark at the the, the bottom, but basically, I'll explain. This is a th is 13 stories. But what you're going to see, because it's difficult to figure out afterwards is that there's 10 stories of student residence built up on top of another building. This is a congested uh, site, and so they decided to do this on top of an existing building. So there's actually four trusses, four full story trusses per floor. You have the two trusses in the middle, which is the corridor, and then you have the two exterior trusses. And there is actually, you see these diagonals, there is one room per diagonal. It's, it's, it's awesome, you know. You can imagine having a student residence and you have this really nice diagonal in your room. It's perfect. So the way this worked is you had two cord splices per truss, but you had splices at every web member. Because you can imagine these are not trusses that really get stacked. You know, the bottom cord is the top cord of the other. So when you're good, what you're going to see is you're going to see when things are getting, when after the first, the first series, it's like a spine that gets delivered. So it's a cord and stubs here and longer members underneath. So you'll get, you'll get a better chance of, to see what they were. Uh, they were. So, and there was some AESS, so obviously the diagonals are exposed. So this is what it looks like. It's not just steel because it's... The model looks like there's lots of steel. There is lots of steel, but there's still space for the students, by the way. And this is what it looks like. This is the exterior truss uh, that you see. Now, can somebody tell me what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> the 
truss the, the diagonals are in the wrong direction. The, the, yeah, the typical steel trusses, you will have them this way. So I asked the engineer, I said, um, what's the technical reason behind this shift in the usual practice? They said, the owner wanted it. I went, what the heck does the owner have? To? They said, it's certainly the architect. Well, apparently the architect said, what would you prefer? Would you prefer the diagonals this way or that way? <laughs> and I told the engineer, where were you? Were you in the same meeting? You know? So, um, so anyway, the owner found this configuration more uplifting. <laughs> so now we have a configuration which is not, you know, the usual practice. So that's how what you have to deal with. What was really important here is there's really a stacking effect here. So when the ca the camber values came to us, we said we're going to do our own calculations because we're a little bit worried. And we had reasons to be worried, and then we worked with the engineer to express our concerns, and we came up with the appropriate number. And that number is two inches and five eighths in the middle trusses at the lower floor. So obviously it's less for the, for the ones that are higher up because they're not getting uh, loaded as much. So it's a big thing. The way we had to assemble them is we had to really make sure they fit, obviously. So uh, they were, the, the, the one that you see at the top is one that just got fabricated. The one you see at the bottom is ready to be shipped. So we would have that set up so that the one waiting to be shipped, came, the, 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 the one that came at the top uh, got fitted. And when it looked like it fit well, we put all the plates we bolted onto the directly onto the um, uh, the cord. Or I could should call it the spine, I guess, and um, and then we proceeded with every one of them. So there's three per truss, four per floor. So we had erectors in our yard doing a lot of this. So this is a little bit of a bigger view. And here you have a little bit more detail on these on these uh, um, slices and connections. And one that was really important is to make sure that the bolt heads were in a particular direction because, of, because it's AESS. So here you have a better view. The bottom one is, was built up on site. But as you go along, as, as you go along it, it's really a spine with stubs that you continue to get. You have a better view of this here. So you can see these are full story. And you see the diagonals going in the wrong direction. Fortunately, because the middle trusses were hidden, we did, they did what was best, and the diagonals are in the other direction. They're hidden, so we didn't have to ask anybody's permission. Okay, so here's how you erect it. It's funny, this project, they were very careful. We're going to look at the camber. We're going to see how we're going to make this thing fit between two towers. It's going to be something, and we're going to you know, do the pre-assembly. But somewhere along the, the road, the communication didn't quite go through. How do we make it go up from here to here? You know, they had it all figured out how they go from here to here and how you transport it, how you unload it. But there was a detail that somebody missed. So if you look at this truss and you see it going up. Uh, so actually, we're, we find it quite interesting that they were taking these pictures and continuing to lift the, the truss. <laughs> So by this time, they saw it, it's, it's not getting straight. So they put it back down. And what you'll see is the difference here is, is that you had two, um, uh, two pickup points. And the actual, the, uh, the, the actual requirement was to have four pickup points. And once that was sorted out, it came up straight and everything was good. But there was a little bit. We couldn't even blame the erector because we were the erector. So it was. Uh, it was a tough one. So the critical one was to get the first, the first one in. So the first one was uh, we built up a box truss, really, as you can see here, that got lifted into place. And this one was kind of critical, and everybody wanted to see it, but we didn't want to, to see too many people in case it didn't fit. Uh, but that's the way it goes. And it was one of the biggest, biggest everything for Manitoba. Manitoba is in the prairies in Canada, anyway. I hope there's nobody from Manitoba here. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and or maybe they're online. Oh, I forget. This is a wider audience. So it, it, you have two lugs here. It's getting picked up, and it's really going a long way to get to its final position. Coming here, and it's starting to get close to destination because it has to clear a big, uh, big area. You can see this is just not your everyday uh, erection. And as you get closer, we had to think of a good connection. And what was interesting is the first time they looked at the calculation here, there was a lot of bolts to fit in. So they said, okay, we've got to figure out for an easier type of connection. So what, that, what they've done is the uh, vertical uh, force is transferred to a plate that is actually welded onto the column. And the, ac the horizontal force is transferred through the bolts. It made for a simpler connection. It also helped uh, installation. So that's how it. So that's where you, you can see where the actual plate is and how we connect it with bolts. Okay. Excuse me. All right. So a better look. Now we're uh, almost in position. We have somebody looks like an iron worker that's looking up, but he's really cozy on these steel beams. Uh, and um, then the final uh, final fit up, and it worked. Now it's interesting that we only discovered recently, well recently, a long time after the project, that sometimes these trusses didn't fit. And so they, when it didn't fit, they put it back down and they waited in early morning when it was much cooler. They tried again, and if it fit again, they never told us. <laughs> so. Um, so we we're talking about temperature it has an impact on these trusses. We had shims too. I mean, things fit, but it's still this construction side. So now you see it going up and up and up, lifting away. And here's the final view. You can see the diagonals here. The rooms inside are absolutely beautiful. I don't have an image of it, but I did get asked how did we protect the diagonals? Because this is not a bracing. Bracing is often just for the lateral system. You don't have to fire protect, but this is a gravity one. So uh, it was intumescent coating. It was done with intumescent coating. The deck was exposed. They used galvanized deck for it to be more um, uh, reflective. And um, the reason they were able to get away without no fire protection is they used semi-light weight concrete and um, arrange the spacing so that they were able to get away without, without the fire protection. So here again, you see the diagonals, the rooms with a diagonal view. Okay, last project is the Calgary International Airport. We're, uh, we're actually finishing that project, so it's a current project. These are all AESS welded trusses. So um, we did this with the Reed Jones, Christofferson, and Ellis Don. Uh, we had the largest truss uh, weighed uh, uh, 45 tons and the shortest 14. There were a lot of triangles and curves, so um, the uh, managing the, the camber was, uh, was something. There was a lot of engineering done there. Um, one of the things we did with the splices, because it's AESS, was we managed to convince the, and I think that's a feature of this project, is we managed to convince the um, architect who has to be on board, uh, the engineer and the GC, that um, having an ugly bolted connection at the bottom cord was much better than the requirement for a full penetration weld. You saw some of Colin's examples of how difficult it is to have these uh, full penetration, how long it takes, how much you're mobilizing time on the site. So um, we suggested something that uh, you'll see later is actually a, um, a, a bolted connection that is hidden and looks nice in the end. Um, lots of pre-assembly we use. We had to really, uh, because it's a 3D truss, we had jigs, we had a rotator, we had to manipulate the trusses in ways that we don't usually uh, do in other projects. This project had uh, the, our, the main features that we worked on was the check-in hall, which is, uh, so anytime you see a little line here, it's a skylight over a truss. Same thing here. And this one was, we started with this one, which is nice because they're all straight. And then the second one is a double vaulted, was a double vaulted section, so it's all curve, no, no dimensions the same. 
There was a lot of AESS, and we used two categories. And this is, I recommend this, this worked out very well for us. The steel that's far away, we tell them not to get too fussy, no grinding, no nothing. This is just a, a, good, a good weld, and that will do because it's far away. And then the stuff that's close up, we, we, it can be more fussy, and you can do some grinding. So we are very uh, happy with this, and it really helped the visit from the architect and the engineer to ASS2, no grinding, remember. So, um, it, but honestly, it was, uh, uh, it was very productive because it aligned expectations. So just to tell you where the trusses are up here, and these were AESS2, you can see how, how high up they are. And the columns are AESS3. We couldn't, usually we say above 20 feet, you should skip to AESS2. But, you know, when you have that height of column, you're not going to say we're going to stop at 20 feet. So there, you have to be reasonable. So uh, these are some of the recommendations. Some of the issues with, uh, that we had here, um, we're going to deal with later, actually. So these, there's three segments. Uh, and this is at the check-in hall that we're looking at. Uh, each segment was put into a jig, what you see at the left. And once everything was assembled properly, we moved it. Uh, we checked the geometry. We moved it to a rotator, which is here. We did all the engineering for that. We have some of the guys that just love to do just the temporary stuff. And this is what the rotator looks like. So we rotate it so that we can always have a good welding position, not only for quality, but for looks. This is top AESS stuff. Then it had to travel 3,000 kilometers on its back. It would be more practical. As, and you can see the, here the, the ugly bolted connection, which is going to be the bottom cord, because remember, it's on its back now the bottom cord connection, uh, splice. So when you get to the side, obviously it's on its back, you've got to get it back up. So, okay, how do you do that? And we actually had a, a foreman who was suggesting an element and then everybody pitched in. And this is the fun part, you know, on doing some of these things. So you, it gets off the, the truck here on the left and then it gets tilted and then it gets into contact here and then it pivots along the other one. So you can see that the, the, this is kind of the, if you like, it's the bottom cord upside down. It gets rotated here, and then it pivots on here, as you can see here. And then when it gets straight, they just lift it and position it in the parking. We, have, we had temporary supports just to park it there, and then we're ready to do the lift. We just lift it in the right position. So we had to do that for all the trusses. And this is how, this is how uh, the rest of the, the erection. So now we're positioning it. Uh, we have, uh, we were able to uh, assemble two of them on the ground. They get lifted. There's a temporary tower that supports it. We put the four struts here. The four struts come in, in between. Then, once those are installed, we pray and then we remove the temporary tower. So. Uh, and uh, there were some adjustments, but it turned out to work very well. And this, this is what this amazing temporary tower is, the Swiss knife of temporary towers, because it had to adjust to so many positions, into two different positions, well, to, uh, and, and it, it got moved around quite a bit. And it had to adjust to the fact that you, all, the, the, all the different supports were not the same, not the same height, not the same anything. So here you have it, it getting uh, an element getting erected, getting positioned, and as I mentioned, the, uh, some of the critical times were when the struts were getting installed. Uh, and some of the issues were uh, with respect to, the, because it's an AESS, there were issues on the, some of the transition points. This was a very good idea because there were high loads coming from the struts. Uh, and um, so instead of having the hollow square, which you see here, this is a full square. And the full square means that you avoid all the gussets, uh, all of a compl complicated section because you've, you're able to transfer the load. So it, it, it's an elegant connection, except the architect didn't like the fact that we couldn't make it fit exactly. Well, a, a square that's filled and a hollow square, they don't match up perfectly. So after a discussion, we said it's really, really high up in the air and we did our best. I think it, 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 it came okay. Now here's the famous uh, bottom cord uh, where we suggest this kind of, uh, um, this kind of uh, splice. 
and look at the bottom, how nice it looks at the end. So what we did, we do is, you know, when they're up in the air in the um, temporary tower, we bolt it in nice position, we're comfortable, and then we put sleeves on it. And on the sleeves, we, we weld it, and then we put uh, putty, or we put fi a filler, and we leave the gap on because that's what they want. So anyway, that was a requirement. We, so you see these little lines, they were pur purposefully left. We stopped asking some questions anyway. <laughs> so um, then there was the situation where you have some squares and um, circular sections intersecting. And the engineer was quite, you know, he realizes that this is not an easy weld for us to do and felt that if he had to redesign, he might have tried to choose the dimensions a little bit differently. But in the end, we were able to, um, to accommodate, you know, these were kind of our first tries. And again, this is the top cord of these trusses that were way up in the air. So they were able to accept it, and this project is almost finished, and it's been a beautiful project, but it's been a challenge. If you want to know, um, this, this project is actually in this book. Uh, Terry Meyer Bogues Architectural Exposed Structural Steel. She actually won a 2015 uh, AISC Educator Special Achievement Award. Uh, and uh, we wrote an article together in uh, Modern Steel Construction on AESS a, a few years back. So we decided to do a Facebook page, which is uh, AESS for you. If you're interested, she's incredible. She travels the world, she loves steel, and there are images from everywhere. And uh, it started sort of like as a fun thing, and now there's 14,000 followers, so <laughs> it's pr pretty impressive. And she's got another book out on diagrid structures. And what I like about her book is that she's, she likes structures, so she, it's not just renderings, it's construction. And there's a lot of details, a lot of ideas that you can come up with or, you know, that can, can help you. We, uh, Colin and I uh, wrote an article in the February edition of Modern Steel Construction, so if you want to summer we see some of the information that we we've provided today uh it's included it's a thousand words so it's not an hour and a half talk but at the same time there are some highlights and checklists and some summary on some of the things that we've uh, that we've presented today on that note i'm going to um, finish with uh, we showed we showed you a truss bridge that was in the quebec city that was quite heavy and actually typical of that era but trusses continue to evolve, and this is a lenticular truss that is absolutely beautiful. It's the um, footbridge called Simone de Beauvoir Passerelle in uh, Paris over the Seine River. And um, it's, I mean, I could have given a talk just on that. So the trusses have evolved. Uh, there's no way you could do this in, steel, uh, in concrete. Uh, so steel is really the solution for trusses, and it satisfies a lot of different uh, requirements. Thank you very much for coming. And again, the PDH code is 56609 on this Friday afternoon on the last session of NASCC. And we would like to see you again in Orlando next year. So thank you very much for coming. Do you have any questions? No, you know what? If you have questions, I suggest you come up with me. I'm going to give you guys a break. <laughs> Uh, we're finishing. Oh, you you have a question, a remote question? Okay. Well, I guess I. Yeah, I, I, I'm listening. Could you please explain why it is not desirable to pretension the splice connections? Why is it not desirable to pretension the splices? I don't have an answer for that. Can somebody help me? I I I don't know why I would want to do that. So. Oh, the pretension, the pretension, but the bolt. Why? Why do we not like to have the the pretension? Yes. Well, I just want to want to comment that the, the pretension of the bolt is more and more more GC, more and more more fast. Oh yes. Okay. Okay. You're answering for me. That's nice. Okay. No. Yes. Well, the pretensioning of bolts means more work, more time, more everything. And the, the turn of the nut method is a proven method, and it's definitely a lot easier for it during erection. Anybody else want to comment or answer on that one? No? Is, is that the only question? Okay. So, well, okay, one last question. 
Anybody? We are good. So if you can come, if you want, come and ask me your questions. Thanks again for coming on call in a nice behalf.